want to welcome each and every one of you to this Wednesday. Thank God to be found in the presence of God, Almighty God. As we approach a Good Friday, let it not just be another festival in your calendar. Actually for us, true believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christmas is every day. Good Friday is every day. Resurrection is every day. We cannot celebrate it just for once in a year. We have the real meaning of every festival in our lives every day. We are experiencing it every day. And we thank God for all the three events, important events in the Christian calendar. Because all the three events are miraculous, beyond man's thoughts, right? The virgin birth cannot be compared to anything in this world. And the virgin birth took place for us. Jesus was born for us. Good Friday, Jesus died on the cross for us. Resurrection. He rose again on the third day for us. And also there is another important event in the calendar. Two more important events in the calendar, in the Christian calendar. The ascension of our Lord, which has not been separated, <coughs> marked out to celebrate. And then, then we have the day of Pentecost when the church was born. So we want to thank and praise God for all these, you know, wonderful uh, events that we can play out every day in our lives and every event is for us for our benefit for our victory in this world there is a verse of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 because you know when it comes to Good Friday for a lot of people, it seems a day of defeat. People go into mourning. People are very sad. Even to church, they will wear white and go. White or black. Right? Yes, it's true. Jesus suffered. Jesus shed his blood. Jesus was bruised and beaten, tortured. It's true. But then we know why he did that. That's a mystery, the godly mystery, which blew the minds of men. Man thought, or the devil thought, that it's finished. When Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. The devil thought it's finished. He had got rid of this menace. Did he, little did he realize that there are going to be a new beginning from that day on. Because from that day on, eternal life came into the human race. So this verse of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I will read it to you, verse 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. This event called Good Friday, this unbelievable, beyond human comprehension, unnatural, cruel, ghastly, bloody, what shall I say, event where a man who knew no sin, a hundred percent innocent man who only did good works, that man is brought like a lamb and slain, right? But the Bible tells us that that is that event was a result of the wisdom of God. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are much higher than our ways. What we would think, that's why Peter took Jesus aside and said, no, you don't suffer. 
I'm not going to let you to be crucified. What was Jesus' reply? Get thee behind me, Satan. Because God's wisdom cannot be measured by human standards. Right? So Paul the Apostle writing here says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I am sure when Jesus died and rose again on the third day, Satan kept his hand on his head and said, Oh my God, what a foolish mistake I have made. That's what the Bible says. None of the princes of this world, these are the demonic princes, none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So you see, what looks like defeat and the cross, the emblem of shame, emblem of defeat, emblem of hopelessness becomes the emblem of victory. That is our God. None of the princes of this world knew. For had they known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. My friend, this evening I want to assure you that our God, you know, the glorious inheritance that we have in Him, if only we have a glimpse of that, if God opens our spiritual eyes and if he gives us a glimpse of the glorious inheritance that we have, I'll tell you none of us will want to live in this world even for a minute. But that's what God has promised us. The way to this glory, the glorious inheritance is through the cross. Amen. Not through education. Not through money, not through name and fame. The only way to this glorious inheritance is the way through the cross. That is what I want you all to comprehend. That Jesus took our sin, our curse, our shame, our sickness, our poverty and he was slain on the cross of Calvary. Would you believe that if I were to tell you that we are all born sinners? Okay. We look at that baby there, Adriel. So innocent, so jubilant, so happy. He is not guilty of any wrongdoing now. He has not spoken even one lie. He has not stolen anything. He has not fought with anyone. He has had no jealousy so far. No pride. So innocent. But still do you know that there is sin inside him. Thank God we have a baby to demonstrate in this meeting, right? Let's say Joash, he has grown, he has been naughty, he has told a lie or two, right? But this baby, 110% innocent, not guilty of any wrongdoing, but still there is sin inside of him. That's why King David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. All right. All of us are born sinners. Where did we inherit it from? We inherited it from Adam and Eve. 
there is no human being who has born on this earth who was born without sin every baby that is being born is born with sin now why do people commit sinful acts do you think that just because they committed adultery they are sinners no they commit adultery because they are sinners do you think just because somebody murders somebody he becomes a sinner no he murders because he is a sinner right just because somebody steals some money you think that person becomes a sinner no he steals that money because he is a sinner that sin that we have inherited which is in our blood is a sin that jesus destroyed on the cross of calvary amen, amen. amen. there is no other way to get rid of that sin no launderer soap no penance no fasting no walking on your you know on your head nothing will take away that sin only the blood that jesus shed on the cross will take that sin away all right So remember the most important thing that Jesus accomplished on the cross was to destroy that sin that is found inside of us. And you know the good news the good news is when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ when we accept him as our Lord and Savior of our lives we are we are completely declared not guilty of that inherent sin we become pure and holy in the sight of god this is what jesus accomplished on the cross and this is what the princes of this world right he had they known that what jesus did on the cross was going to destroy the chains of sin in man they would have never ever crucified the lord my friend what a great blessing what a great privilege think of this none of us did not do anything to rid of ourselves of that sin none of us in fact we cannot do anything to get rid of that sin none of us can only an act of grace it is by grace ye are saved paul says only the act of grace by god and god alone that has brought salvation I want you each one of you to count it so blessed to have known the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the day he died on the cross the doors of eternity opened. Even the old testament saints were waiting for that day because they could not go into eternity until Jesus had shed his blood for their sins. The moment Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross the doors of eternity opened the old testament saints and we the new testament christians now we can enter into the glorious eternity which Jesus has prepared for us that is why death is not a defeat for us death is a doorway to go into eternity my friend this evening as we remember the lord's death actually we should not be mourning and crying we should be rejoicing because our chains have been broken our names have been written in the lamb's book of life 
Nobody can erase it. Nobody can delete it. Our names are written in glory because of what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. I want you all to rejoice this coming Friday. Don't be, you know, start meditating the, the what do you call the sufferings of Christ. Meditate. Doesn't matter very good. But always remember, rejoice in your heart for what Jesus did on the cross. Because that is victory for us. You can always look at the face of the devil and tell him, Hey, my Savior gave his life on the cross so that I may have eternal life. So that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Therefore, my friend, Good Friday is a day of victory. That's why I titled this message, Victory in Death. Right? If, if a man dies, all his family members, his close friends will shed tears and be sad. And that will be there for about two years, three years. After that, that man will be just a memory. But the death of Jesus, we can experience it every day in our lives. Because we who have been delivered from this sin, we know what it is to have the freedom in Christ Jesus. Amen. The death, the victory in death. Jesus hanging on that cross. With all the suffering, all the pain, blood that flowed out of his body. He would have been so weak and fragile. What do you think would have been in his mind? Who would have been on his mind? Think of it. Did he have houses and property on this world, in this world? To think about those. Did he have, has he, had he stacked up gold and silver and all the jewelry? To think about those. Did he think about, did he have any degrees and, you know, qualifications and titles to think about those? No. When he was hanging on the cross, you and I were in his mind. The pain that he underwent, he would have thought, he would have thought of Lambert, that great sinner, if I don't do this for him, he will go to hell. When he was on the cross, you and I were on his mind. And guess what? That gave him the motivation to go through this whole procedure. The sin of the world. He looked at all the millions and billions of people. The, the, the movement that he started with 12 guys. Think of this. 12 guys. Out of them, one fellow betrayed him. Other fellow denied him. But later on, he said sorry and came back. So now he has learned. With those 11 people, he has taken over the world. Amen. Why? How did he do it? The death on the cross of Calvary. My friend, therefore, there is victory in his death. And we can boldly say, my Jesus died for me. Therefore, I am victorious. You know, I came across a passage in Ezekiel. <coughs> I hope you won't find it offensive when I read this. <clears throat> this is speaking about our 
spiritual state before we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Not our physical state, not our natural state, but our spiritual state before we accepted the Lord. Ezekiel 16 verses 4 to 6. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in clothes. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born you were despised. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. You know, these verses gripped my heart. That was my spiritual condition before I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I was not white. I was not washed with water. I was full of sin. I was full of my own blood, no one to cleanse me. I was thrown aside, despised, right? I was all alone. I would have died if Jesus didn't come and rescue me. He saw me. He looked at me. He had compassion on me. He had great love for me. And what did he do? He said, okay. I will shed my blood and wash away the filthy blood that you are covered with, the blood of sin. Think about it, my friend. Today we don't think much of salvation in Christian circles. Today it's all miracles, healing, prosperity, this, that. But the greatest miracle that can happen to any man is salvation. Is when that man, you know, accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. That is the most important miracle and that is the only miracle that lasts for eternity. You can be blessed and become a multi, multi billionaire and go to hell. You can be healed of cancers and tumors and you name anything but still go to hell. But when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ and when he washes you with his blood, you will go to eternal life. Think about it. What great salvation that God has given to us. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Don't we have an obligation to live for that person who died for us so that we may live? Are we going to take this salvation for granted? Oh yeah, Jesus died, fine. I'm a Christian, fine. I'll go to church once a week, fulfill my obligation. No. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Live for Jesus, my friend. Whatever you accomplish on this world is temporary. Let me repeat it. Whether it's money or name or fame or whatever, it's all temporary. Only what you do for Jesus will last for eternity. Amen. Amen. For God so loved the world. This great love. This great love. And I used to wreck my brain trying to think of because the Bible talks so much of God's love. Ultimately, I came to one conclusion. Man will never be able to comprehend God's love unless God supernaturally reveals it to him. 
we have mental knowledge that god loves us that's not good enough but if we have a revelation a supernatural revelation from god the love that he has for us that is why paul writing in ephesians says i pray that your eyes will be enlightened so that you will know the glorious inheritance that you have we have to get that revelation from god how much god loves us and what he has done for us and what he has prepared for us we are coming to psalm 103 the first three verses bless the lord oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord oh my soul and forget not all his benefits so apart from delivering us from sin there are other benefits from the cross there it says in psalm 133 who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases so here you talking about salvation and healing together that means we have not only salvation from the cross but healing isaiah 53 5 says but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed there is healing for our physical sickness on the cross by his stripes we were healed so what a great privilege that we have in the cross of the lord jesus christ when he was hanging on that cross he was between heaven and earth god could not look at this earth because it was so corrupt full of sin and wickedness but jesus hanging on that cross with one hand he was holding god the father's hand with the other hand he was holding man's mankind's hand and he reconciled god the father and man together by laying his life on the cross and today we can exercise our faith to receive healing for our sick bodies for by his stripes we were healed the front side of the cross is salvation forgiveness of sins the other side of the cross is healing also the other benefit prosperity from the cross this is a controversial topic lot of preachers want to touch on this and there will be a lot of preachers who will criticize criticize even me for saying what i'm going to say now there is a verse of scripture in 2 corinthians 8 and 9 for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich this is a very very controversial was people don't want to you know talk about this verse of course the prosperity gospelers have taken this and they are going to town with it but others even i myself have spoken with lot of christian leaders they don't want to talk about it they are scared <coughs> there you can't say that jesus died on the cross so that i get rich contrary to what the bible teaches but this verse is there 2 corinthians 8 and 9 for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich he became poor so that through his poverty we may become rich so i went into the greek for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich i looked at that word rich in the greek it says plusios which means abounding in wealth abounding in wealth that is talking about god right that though he was rich he was plusios abounding in wealth 
Yet for your sake he became poor. When did Jesus become poor? On the cross of Calvary. He lost everything. All his glory, all his power, even the clothes he lost. Hanging naked on the cross. Poor as poor. Right? For your sake he became poor. So that you through his poverty might become rich. So this rich, I checked in the Greek. That word is Kyotio, meaning just rich. The earlier rich is Prusios, abounding in wealth. That is, God is abounding in wealth. This rich is Plotio, just normal rich. And it's money, right? Talking about money. So I want you to know. That Jesus died on the cross so that you will be blessed. Amen. That's what this Bible <coughs> tells me. But of course, you can't take this verse out of context. Alright? You have to take it in that context. Why Paul said this? To whom did he say it? That's the most important thing that we have to see. To whom did Paul write this? All right. Okay, that was 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. So let's read 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1 onwards. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know that about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people and they exceeded our expectations they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and by the will of God also to us but since you excel in everything in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have killed in you See that you also exceed, excel in the grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. That is the context. To whom is Paul writing 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, he became poor, so that through his poverty you may become rich. He is writing to these Macedonian churches who are in extreme poverty. They did not have enough food for themselves. So poor. But amidst all those trials, amidst all that poverty, they still collected some money for God's people and they are pleading earnestly with Paul, please accept our offering. Amen. Think about it. These Macedonian people, they were not rich. They were poor in abject poverty. They did not have enough food for themselves. But it is all that they are saying, we want to give this offering to God's people. And Paul would have said, no, you all are suffering, I don't want. But they are pleading with him, Paul, please accept our offering. To such people, Paul is writing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor, so that through his poverty, you may become rich, my friend. And I want to focus on verse number 8. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing with the earnestness of others. You see, the giving of offering to the Lord is not under compulsion. You give because you love the Lord. You give not because you have. You give even when you don't have because you love the Lord. That's what the Macedonian church did. Paul is saying, I want to test your sincerity of your love. Today, sad to say, people come, they pray, pray, pray. God bless me, bless me, I want to do this. God blesses them. 
after that they forget about God. They don't have love for God. They don't give offerings. Leave alone giving their ten percent. Majority of Christians don't. Why? They must learn a lesson from the Macedonian churches. And for them only, Paul wrote two Corinthians eight and nine. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor, so that through his poverty you may become rich. Let us examine our hearts whether we truly love the Lord. He has blessed us so much, immensely, immensely. Think about it. None of us go to sleep in poverty. None of us sleep on the pavement because we don't have a house. God has given to us everything that we need. But have we given Him back out of love? What about the sacrifice on the cross? Think about it and don't you want to pour your heart out in love for Him? Think about it. If He didn't bless you, where would you be? How much we cry and pray, God bless, bless. How much have we given out in return? I will always keep as a motto in my life what Pastor Colton used to say all and continuously. God will never be a debtor to any man. No one can outgive God. Amen. Today Christians don't have faith. They, they don't have love for the Lord. They only want to receive. All are Dhanadeyas. No Dhanadeyas. All right. Coming to the great climax, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 28 verses 2 to 6. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Tell me, you know the Bible says the last enemy of man is death. God told Adam and Eve the day you eat this fruit you will die. From that day onwards man has been dying. Nobody could conquer death. No doctor could save anyone or prevent anyone from dying. Death comes naturally. But you know, for you and me, children of God, death was destroyed by Jesus when that stone was rolled away and the Holy Spirit descended into his dead body and brought him back to life, breaking the chains of death. Jesus is the only one who defeated death. Amen. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 26 and 55, he says, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The last enemy of man was destroyed and that was death. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Jesus never left anything incomplete. He completed the mission that he came to do. Born to die. Died to resurrect. And resurrected to ascend. And now he is seated on the right hand of God the Father. Interceding for you and for me. My friend, the last enemy was defeated on that day. 
that was death. Today we have eternal victory because we do not fear death. For us, death is a gateway to enter eternity. Amen. You lose a loved one, you may cry a little, but be assured and be joyful that so and so has gone into the presence of the Lord. That's why Christians don't die, don't cry in funerals. They ought to rejoice because somebody has gone into eternal life. And I'll tell you, you lose a Christian brother or a Christian sister and our hearts are broken, we cry. But you know, they don't care two hoots for your tears. They are so joyful in His presence. Amen. They are not, they can't even remember you. They are so full of joy. That's why they have joy in resurrection. Because we die with Him, we are risen again with Him. Amen. Our story never ends. A Christian story never ends. It goes on forever and ever and ever. For eternity. You can never close the chapter of a Christian's life. It goes on for eternity. In the presence of God. Amen. So I want you to, as you enter Good Friday and Easter, you should rejoice. You know, 30th on Saturday evening, we are having the special Good Friday Resurrection Day service at Hotel Sapphire in Tamil. I told you don't sing only two Good Friday songs. After all rejoicing, because we are not the defeated kind. Yeah. Amen. Right. We are victorious. Our chains have been broken. Our history, our geography, everything has been rewritten. Our destiny is wonderful, glorious, unspeakable joy because Jesus died for us and he rose again on the third day. And if we die with him, we will also rise with him and we will be seated with him in heavenly places. Shall we all rise to our feet and we are going to sing, we are going to sing rejoicing and be happy in the Lord, right? I cannot let you all go home with a sad face. I do not know how you all came. Probably something is bothering you. But all the chains are going to be broken. Amen. Every fatigue, every tiredness is going to go away. Because Jesus died and rose again on the third day. And if we rose again, we are also risen along with him. Let's join the Lord. Oh, glory be to God.
come to God, worshiping a living God. The Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. He broke the death. He broke the death. He, he defeated the enemy. He not only defeated the enemy, he broke all the curses in your life, in your generation, a generation back, a generation to come. He broke every curse, every disease through the cross of Calvary. Yourself to the Lord this evening. Give the Lord to the Lord. Give the Lord. Give the Lord. Give the Lord to Jesus. That our dreams broken heart, broken soul. Oh